<laughs> All right, we've reached one o'clock, and it looks like we have a good audience for a talk that is uh, scheduled at a difficult time of year. Uh, so uh, it's wonderful to see such good turnout for a December seminar. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I can recognize about half of the audience, but those who may not know me, I'm Steve Welch. I teach modern German history in the School of Historical and Philosophical Studies. And I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, Michael Lynch. Uh, as the flyer for the talk indicates, Michael is currently an honorary fellow in the School of Historical Studies at the University of Leicester in the UK. Uh, he's had a very distinguished academic career uh, prior to this. He's worked at and taught at a number of UK universities. He's been a visiting lecturer at universities in France and in Germany. And over the course of his academic career, he's produced over 30 books. And a look over that list of publications indicates the breadth of his interests. He's written about British history, about uh, German history, about Russian history, about Chinese history. So. He has a very broad and comparative uh, basis in his historical research. Uh, the main area of his current research is on 20th century totalitarian regimes, and uh, this has been reflected in a biography of Mao, which is in the Routledge Historical Biography series. That's also the series in which uh, his most recent book on Hitler, the basis for his talk today, uh, Hitler's, this also appears in that same series, and I think projected works are a biography of Castro and also a book on Confucianism in modern China. So Michael's talk today is based on this most recent publication on uh, Hitler, and the title of his talk is Working Towards the Fuhrer, a Reappraisal of Hitler's Role in Nazi Germany. I'll stand if you don't mind. I was told years ago there's a correlation between people slumbering and the lecturer standing. So I'll stand. So you're now on your honour not to fall asleep. Uh, come with me, if you will, to a place called Passavalk near Stettin. The date is November 1918. And we're in a hospital that's run by Dr. Edvard Forster. And he has a difficult patient to deal with. The patient uh, is blind, has gone blind as a result of war injuries, but the eyes have no significant damage, according to those who studied the patient. He ought to be able to see, but cannot. It is manifestly from hysteria. So Forster, being very progressive, very shrewd psychiatrist as well as a medical man, decides on a ruse. And he calls the soldier in, a 29-year-old soldier. He sits him in a chair and says, <clears throat> You are blind, and the blindness is permanent. Such is a damage to your eyes, you will never see again. He stumps forward, the soldier, puts his head in his hands, and Ford says, You are a German soldier, a soldier of the Reich. Reich's there. Do not succumb to weakness. Sit up, bolt up, he said. Blindness betrays lesser men, but greater men overcome blindness. Are you a titan or are you of the weak? And the soldier sits bolt upright and mumbles something to the effect that he belongs to the titans if only he were given the chance. The soldier, obviously, was Adolf Hitler. He'd been blinded in a gas attack late in the war. In November 1918, he's taken to this hospital. He's unlike all the other troops, all the others there. The doctor records are malingerers. They're there to get out of something. They're there to see out the war. Not this soldier. He wants to get back, but he's blind. And it's hysterical blindness, which the doctor can't fathom, except as some form of mental blockage. So this shock treatment, this shouting man, I've truncated the conversation somewhat. When he shouts at Hitler, and makes Hitler literally sick up, there begins a process of about three weeks, it's reckoned, 
where gradually Hitler recovered his sight. Images, shade images first of all, then difference between light and shade, eventually full sight. He comes out of hospital, late 1918, into a world that's changed since he went in. The war has ended, Germany has surrendered, the armistice is about to be signed, and this young, 29 year old, if that's young, feels in some way totally detached from the world he's occupied in the previous four years. Now that's a way of a lead in to try and get some angle, some notion of the character of Hitler in that critical period from 1918 through to 1920. Because the argument I'm going to run through is that in those critical two years, Hitler's ideas are formed in a way that they hadn't been prior to 1918. There is, I've called it a myth, that in some way Hitler was already advanced towards his eventual position as a Nazi by the end of the war. His own writings, which of course Mein Kampf is the principal one, indicate that in some way he learned from the experience of 1914-18, plus what he'd experienced in Vienna pre-1914, he's learned of the great Jewish menace. He's learned of the threat to German culture and German values, and he's set on a path of regeneration of the nation. It's a myth. It's a myth. Hitler, before 1918, was a very confused man. He wasn't notably anti-Semitic. If we look at the record, and there's a lot of work being done on him fairly recently, if we look at the record, he shows no sign of that intense anti-Semitism that we identify as a major characteristic of his career from that point on. He was more bewildered than he was conscious of where he was going. Um, during the war, he had Jewish contacts very considerably. He had Jewish officers over him. He barracked with Jewish uh, soldiers. Um, he shows no sign of ever being anti-Semitic in a meaningful way prior to 1918. That's even true if you go back before 1914. If you read Mein Kampf, 